my name is Victoria Reichel. Uh, for the past five years, I've been the m and &E manager of IMPACT, which is a medium-sized international NGO headquartered in Ottawa, Canada. Um, IMPACT's organizational mission can be described as to transform how natural resources are managed in areas where security and human rights are at risk. So IMPACT is currently active in several countries across Sub-Saharan Africa and the DRC, Uganda, Zimbabwe, Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso and Mali. Um, IMPACT has been known before 2017 as Partnership Africa Canada and was founded in the 1980s and has gone through a very interesting organizational transformation since its creation. It has started off as a coalition of Canadian civil society groups, uh, which were tasked with dispersing funds from the Canadian International Development Agency directly to African CSOs uh, for longer term projects um, in Africa. In the early 2000s, IMPACT began extensive research into human security, peace building, and the mismanagement of natural resources in Africa and across the globe. In the first decade of the millennium, uh, IMPACT published over 30 reports, amongst which were the heart of the matter on the links between diamonds and human security in Sierra Leone, that for the first time really connected diamonds with conflict financing. This report would later lead to the Kimberley Process Certification Scheme, which was signed over 50, by over 50 governments, uh, the diamond industry and a small group of NGOs, with the goal to better control the trade of rough diamonds and to ensure that no conflict diamonds enter the legal supply chain. Um, only over the past 10 years, um, after nearly 30 years of existence, IMPACT has started to also implement development projects, mostly working directly with artisanal mining communities uh, on the various issues that the sector is facing. So the historical background uh, as a CSO coalition uh, and then later as an organization that commissioned, I think we can qualify as investigative research, uh, is really extremely important for the way impact today is still operating its implementation projects. Um, first of all, um, the boundaries between a more classical m and &E approach for development interventions that go with the tools we all know, the theory of change log frame um, that show clear attributions between activities and outputs and results uh, and performance measurement frameworks, etc. cetera. Um, on the one hand, so the classical m and &E, uh, and the research on the other hand, where learning uh, or even investigative research are those boundaries are really extremely fluid uh, for the organization um, because both they're deemed necessary to contribute to the better understanding of what we think is a very complex context uh, or in artisanal mining. And on the other hand, this history is also important because impact tends to still strongly rely uh, on the solid connections to local actors and networks uh, as the buy-in is important for making projects sustainable uh, and the perspective is needed also to understand what are right incentives uh, at each level of intervention. So my remarks are really tied a lot to actual projects uh, and activities of impact, uh, the challenges we have seen when designing projects or implementing them uh, in most of the time complex environments. So my experience in monitoring and evaluation is not the one of an external evaluator. Uh, my m &E experience is really grounded in the connection to all project activities. Um, and related to m and &E for IMPACT's projects over the past five years. Uh, being it the support of monitoring of progress for activities um, and outputs, uh, the organization of data collections uh, with third parties, uh, the editing uh, of baseline studies and support to project reports. Um, this means my perspective is really very internal uh, and draws from the very, I'd like to say, intimate knowledge uh, of our projects. Um, as a result, my remarks might eventually be not limited to um, a pure m &E perspective only, but maybe touch upon challenges that are more generally related to operating in, in, in the complex environments um, that we're working in. 
Um, so over the past 15 years, uh, IMPACT has been working on a dozen of countries in sub-Saharan Africa uh, on several aspects of artisanal and small-scale mining. Uh, examples of project interventions uh, are, for example, the analysis and test of approaches to reform laws, regulations and practices to tackle illicit trade, financing of minerals, um, to strengthen supply chain transparency uh, and illicit trade and financing, uh, and provide for gender equality and responsible environmental stewardship. For this, we mostly work with government agencies and host countries. Um, at all levels, uh, from local to national, regional, uh, with private, actor, uh, private sector actors like miners themselves, um, their government's bodies uh, like associations or cooperatives, also exporters, um, and also with a very strong network uh, of CSOs. So in most of our projects, you find aspects of long-term cooperation with governments uh, to advance legal reforms um, along with our partners uh, and an aspect of local implementation that tries to actually document uh, how some of the factors that we address on the theoretical level can actually pan out in reality. So when we started our implementation projects about 10 years ago, we considered most of them as pilots. Um, actually, for quite a while, we referenced we referred to most of our projects uh, as pilots until we acknowledged that it's simply the nature of our programming and that we'll probably never have a very standard program to roll out um, because we were really trying to do things that haven't been tried a lot um, by then in the sector. An example is the first uh, export of conflict-free artisanal gold from Eastern DRC to a Canadian jeweler. Um, with a proven chain of custody that was in 2017. Um, that was an example really that helped us document the costs of legal gold trade at every single step in the supply chain and to help foster the message, for example, that responsible sourcing and transparency alone are not a, enough to address uh, the root causes of poverty and conflict. Obviously, data and m and &E, uh, were a huge part of the equation for documenting costs, sales prices, um, transaction margins. Um, another example is the setup of village savings and loans associations, um, VSLAs, very basic savings groups in mining communities. And to study um, this development intervention under different angles, um, for example, the effect um, of those groups on community resilience and social cohesion um, and also how those cash groups might influence how quickly miners want to convert their gold into cash. Um, in Burkina Faso, where we launched um, about 50 of these groups in, in late 2021, uh, we have been seeing the effects of growing national insecurity, uh, especially in the northern regions, uh, on the security perceptions of those who hold the money um, of, their, of their group members. So this has forced us to become very proactive on solutions that protect the members, and especially those, mostly women, who had the responsibility to take care of the cash boxes. Um, I think we were pretty successful because we could record it only one single theft, and it occurred at the very beginning when that cash box was actually still empty. Um, documenting our security interventions and how they were perceived by community members was therefore part of our endline survey and the reporting in 2022. Um, another example is our work on gender, uh, which started as a collaboration between academic research um, and, 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 and ourselves and got summarized at one of the, I th I'd like to say, one of the first comprehensive academic research studies on women's roles uh, and opportunities in artisanal mining, in this case, East Africa. Uh, the report today is still a reference uh, for many practitioners today and has laid the groundwork for a lot of impacts programming up to date. Um, one of the major learning outcomes for us was the fact that understanding um, and breaking down, for example, the labor division in mine sites has to be something basic and systematic that you cannot skip. 
Uh, you cannot skip out on if you want to understand how a mindset is organized. So who has control over the resource, at what stage and how gender and other aspects of human identity come into play. Um, it would be misleading to simply generalize and consider all humans involved in mineral extractions having the same revenue or bearing the same risks. We know that it's very differentiated. Uh, they all have different relationships as well to the ones who decide and hold the power in the industry and the supply chain. And while some tasks and the sequence in which the mineral flows through the chain are the same across most contexts, um, most people tend to do several tasks and there, there, there are differences obviously from one context to the other. Uh, and one of them is really how men and women are differently involved in the different tasks. So the example you see here is really um, one of our, yeah, basic baseline information that, that we're getting. In many contexts, um, for example, women uh, would often not even define themselves as minors because minors, even from a local perspective, um, would often cover only the, the, the task of, uh, of digging um, so we see, for example, here in this, in this example of Burkina Faso, um, this 80% of the, of the men uh, we had interviewed back then were actively involved in digging, whereas only 17% of women. So women um, do secondary roles um, like washing, crushing minerals, and many times they see themselves also as only helping out their husbands uh, in the mine. So you wouldn't potentially even, they wouldn't even uh, feel concerned by any type of intervention like a training on health and safety or efforts to help miners formalize in larger groups uh, for economies of scales of all kinds. So really for us today, this type of analysis is basic project information because it's essential to unpack those tasks and to understand the complexity of how artisanal mining is organized on the mine site. Uh, for us, this is really also the only way to make women visible and to ensure we understand where to find them. Um, this work has later led to the development of a gender impact assessment toolkit, uh, which also provides tools and methodologies uh, for capturing other aspects of gendered approach of natural resource governance. Um, so. At one point, we came to acknowledge that impact operates um, in, 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 in that niche sector that is artisanal and small scale mining in conflict and affected areas. Uh, and despite the fact that artisanal and small scale mining or ASM, as we refer to it a lot, um, employs, well, informal employment, of course, for the majority close to 100 million people around the world. Um, I'm saying niche because from a classic development perspective, um, it unfortunately still remains widely underserved and unknown territory. Um, many donors, including governments, international organizations, remain still very reluctant to invest funds in projects that directly support artisanal mining, as it's still considered too contentious for many donors. So we at impact and like-minded organizations, we believe that because there are so many challenges, actually more investments, including research is needed to address them. So in practice, and here's why m and &E remains so important to us, it often feels like we have to deconstruct a large set of negative cliches um, that are associated with artisanal mining. So do basically um, education, um, in, in informing about the realities of the sector with every single project. Um, so the list of examples of stigmatization and wrong assumptions is, is actually quite long. For example, um, one thing that is commonly as assessed or, or, um, or imagined is that all women working in artisanal mining are necessarily victims of gender-based violence. So with with regards to women, of course, there are problems that need to be addressed uh, when intervening in those contexts. But um, even if women might earn less, we can see here, uh, it's pretty common, earn less money than men when comparing their income for specific mining tasks, then 
when we compare them to other income generating activities, it is most of the time with mining that they earn the most of the money and can pay school fees and food. Um, so banning women from mine sites under the pretext of protecting them, which occurred a lot in the past, means cutting them off from their income. Um, another example is because mining bears so many health, safety and environmental risks. Um, some strategies, including national laws in some countries, would likely would like to simply banish artisanal mining. Yet we know that moving people straight out of ASM into other sectors is, is not a realistic strategy, uh, as there are typical, typically few other employment opportunities. Um, bans are putting those fragile communities even more at risk. So programs that aim to encourage more income generating activities within or along the ASM supply chains, for example, gemstone cutting, polishing, have shown positive results here. Um, another example is all miners only do mining all the time, change location, are very migrant, so not at all. Miners uh, often are not only miners, uh, often we find farmers amongst them who need cash to buy agricultural entrants. Um, so one of the understandings we're trying to foster is that agriculture and ASM need to be seen as complementary, as opposed to two activities that are fundamentally at odds many families turn to ASM to supplement their farming earnings and invest in farming and farm inputs. So even when defining our target population, we really have to have a good sense of the descriptor that we use in the baseline survey, how we check the box on who's a miner and who isn't, uh, depending also on the season when we get into mine sites. Um, so really one basic information we are always looking for is since when people also are living in mining communities and since when they are active uh, in mining and how many months a year, for example. So it's a sector full of unknown, <laughs> of things we assume uh, or heard about, uh, tend to generalize as well. So I mean, he for us is a powerful and necessary tool to contribute to learning about the sector. I have a couple of suggestions and lessons learned. Um, first of all, um, and the two first ones are related, so might, might sound contradictory, but, but are probably not. Uh, at least for, for us, they are not. Um, so the first one would be to really try to remain as flexible as you can in terms of commitments in a context that is complex and conflict prone. Um, this means you should try to get yourself as much space as possible to remain flexible and adapt to changes quickly with regards to targets and metrics. We often, for example, added indicators uh, for our donor reporting along the way or change the definitions of indicators um, along the road, obviously in a very transparent manner with our partners and donors. Um, unfortunately, not all donors are open to that approach of flexibility and really don't like when you change uh, metrics or adapt your targets. However, I would argue that most donors who fund projects today in fragile environments mm -hmm. um, know that this flexibility is necessary and, and, and just common sense. So while we have this flexibility on the reporting side, um, we really um, know that it's important that we try to cover our internal needs for research in environments that are complex and are also rapidly changing. So most of the time our projects can only contribute to try to resolve a piece of a puzzle. Often the mandate of a donor is only addressing maybe one piece of the complex issue that, that we're looking at might be gender inequality, it might be environmental pr pollution, pr protection, deforestation. It is rare that we see projects that would finance interventions on a really holistic level as we would like them, um, how we could need them, let alone the time frame that is needed to address um, root causes of conflict, um, illicit trade or poverty. Um, 
yeah, they're always too short. So with these limitations, we keep in mind that with Emily, at least, we can address that need for education about a sector that is still not well understood. So that's why we produce byproducts, research reports that document our findings, even if they're a bit outside of our project's theory of change. Uh, also sometimes not clear at the beginning what we are able to, um, to document or to analyze um, our, our findings. Um, but obviously are complementary to what we are trying to achieve. Uh, for instance, in a recent report, we were trying to deconstruct the idea that the need uh, for formal financing in, in the artisanal mining sector can simply be addressed with some banks willing to offer a loan here and there to, to pre-finance uh, gold production or the acquisition of some fancy mercury-free equipment. Um, it's really surprising to what extent this, this simple idea is, is very common but misleading and not serving the large portion of artisanal miners that who are illiterate, who are not organized in groups that would allow them a, an economy of scale um, to take and to take an, an um, yeah to, to acquire an interesting equipment. Um, they, they might not trusting banks because they are only present in cities, um, not in the areas they work and live in uh, and charge high fees. So, um, and also oftentimes they don't have the experience with doing savings on their personal level. So on this slide, we compare the national statistics of financial inclusion, um, on the national level which in Burkina Faso are already pretty low compared to other countries, including in Sub-Saharan Africa. With the data we have collected amongst two artisanal mining populations in Burkina Faso, where we had a project. So we can really see how much of a gap there is in those communities. And the idea behind our project here was to try to offer entry level financial services in the form of VSLAs again, uh, something I've mentioned before, um, to members of the mining communities. The concept of VSLAs is around for 20 or 30 years. It's really mainstream development practice, yet the application on artisanal mining remains rather timid. Again, it's most uh, probably due to the misconceptions and stigma that the sector is experiencing. So for a mini perspective, the donor mostly required us uh, mostly required to know how many people we served uh, with those savings groups, how many groups uh, we assisted in creating and how many savings maybe they, they created. However, we wanted to know more and triangulated primary data from data collections with the data we had access to from the group's logbooks, for example, to understand, for example, how loyal miners were in, compared, com in comparison um, to other community members, uh, how they were loyal to the approach, whether women and men had different experiences. Um, coming back to the lesson learned, it, it really, um, yeah, address your eternal needs for research that you think is needed to advance your mission. And as I said, we do a lot of research still in house, we produce many reports. Um, as many reports as we can to document our findings publicly. Um, but to increase our bandwidth, we also collaborate directly with academic research who, um, on the one hand, help us make our data forms, for example, more robust. Um, this, for example, includes that we systematically work with control groups uh, in our data collections, or that we adapt data collection protocols uh, that like here can compare to national statistics because they have been collected the same way. Um, they also help us to use the data to advance their own research with obviously more capacity and different timelines. Um, and they help us take advantage really of the rich primary data sets that we are collecting um, because we operate in, in contexts where data is really scarce. Um, sometimes it might even be hard to get a sense of the number of population of a village or a mine camp. So we, we are aware <laughs> of, 
of the richness of, of the data that we are that we're looking at. Um, for instance, we are currently collaborate with Queen's University um, in Kingston, Canada, uh, to advance knowledge around the real costs of socially and environmentally responsible mineral production and trade, and how the value of social interventions like our projects can actually realistically be absorbed in international value chains. So that's just an example. My third suggestion would be to try to not reinvent the wheel. <laughs> uh, this applies as much for project design uh, as for data collection analysis. Um, this is really to streamline processes, even if the context is different every time. Uh, the orientation project is also uh, different. Um, for example, in terms of programming, there are a lot of solutions I, I hinted to before. There are, there are many solutions out there from other informal rural sectors um, like agriculture that can be brought into artisanal mining. Um, the VSLA story is a perfect example. In terms of data collection, we use um, methodologies and analytical tools, for instance, the gender impact assessment tools, which I presented before, uh, also environment assessments, supply chain assessments. Um, or another example is the approach of the a conflict analysis, which pays very specific attention to drivers of conflict and that helps us understand where parties oppose each other including those that might not have a very strong voice, for instance, migrant mine workers from other countries or different land users. So really my third key lesson is that while the context and challenges can differ hugely between projects as a specialized medium-sized NGO that we are, it's definitely worthwhile to make investments into tools and methodologies that can be used across the board and that can help kick off baselines and projects much faster. Um, and sometimes we have the opportunity to share them in public facing formats like the GIA toolkit. My fourth lesson learned um, would be to allow for an information flow that is carried uh, by the people who are part of the experience or say the, let the results be carried by by the people who are part of the experience so not a huge fan of the word beneficiary but i think everyone knows what i'm talking about so we want to provide space for local stakeholders beneficiaries to present project outcomes in their view um, so that can really enrich our own view to understand where they see their biggest achievements, which experience has marked them the most. Um, and it can obviously enrich our future project design, but it will also empower people and develop their leadership skills. Um, in many projects, for example, uh, we have let women miners present their views or results of a project in front of round tables of um, government officials. And it has been very, um, yeah, remarkable experience for both for both parts. Um, my last point is probably the least tangible one, but very important. Um, so I wrote alignment with values of project partners um, because they can transcend the beneficiaries and can reinforce or hinder development outcomes. What I mean here is um, to actually do really a thorough value check into your partners on the ground and try to get a sense of maybe where subjectivity can, can come into play. In other words, um, how are the people that we present you in the field, how are they perceived by those that you're trying to serve? Um, I mean, in conflict affected areas or regions, um, all realities translate into opinions that can easily harm others put them um, so opinions can be very strong so we as an organization who hire people to deliver certain messages or in or do inquiries about sensitive topics we really have the obligation to understand if the people we hire have biases that can harm or if they are able to show respect to the people 
they serve for interview. And it's extremely important for communities of artisanal mining, where, as I said before, many people have strong prejudices about. So this actually applies really to everyone involved in our project, the project team members, partners on the ground, experts you rely on the field, consultants that you send into the field, but also enumerators for data collection. Um, those opinions, they will really decide whether some of, um, for example, a few intermediaries, local authorities, uh, customer chiefs also will support your work or not, and for the good reasons. Um, in artisanal mining, we witness a large variety of degree of support for miners and their needs. Um, so imagine, for example, you hire a trainer on mercury mitigation. You're about to send this person into the field, present something very technical to a group of men and women. Um, we don't have the possibility to stand next to this person <laughs> to monitor how the content is transmitted, but we want to avoid that a misplaced comment here or an unconsideration of specific needs of, of a person or groups might lead to a feeling of exclusion. So those type of interventions, if not well um, not well framed, uh, can actually very easily undermine the rest of your interventions and, and reinforce, for example, existing power dynamics that you're working very hard to deconstruct or flatten. So after a thorough value check through dialogue with our teams, for instance, it, it happened already that we could in the end not work with someone who initially on paper was actually perfectly qualified for doing a survey or a training. Um, more specifically for data collections, uh, while we mostly work in local languages, that means no respondent understands English or French. Uh, so we don't always, uh, and we don't always have staff employed who necessarily speak all of those local languages, which can be yeah, a, a long list of them. This means that there must be a lot of dialogue to agree on the real meaning of questions uh, when we work with, uh, with organizations as local as they can be on delivering um, surveys. Um, work hard with really getting to a real meaning of response options because not all contents or concepts are translatable. Um, ethni uh, ethnicity differences can equally raise all sorts of biases that one needs to avoid. So for instance, beyond women only interviewing women, of course, and, and men only men, we know we need to pay attention to other criteria uh, if we ho hope to get good quality data. So in a nutshell, I think it, it's never just, we never just send our data collection form by email <laughs> or let alone our indicator framework uh, to a consultancy or organization, hope they figure, they figure it out. We really take a long time and it's a very hands-on process. Um, and I believe it's, it really reflects the amount of effort that we as a team put into the preparation of data collection uh, with the risk that people take if the data collection was not well prepared. So these would be my five lessons learned. Um, so thank you for making me thinking about them. And again, thank you for the opportunity um, for the spotlight uh, of our work. Um, I have left some links in here and as well um, some recent research reports that might be of interest. Thank you.